What's up, my good people? Politics. Dirty tricks are those political maneuvers that go beyond mere negative campaigning. They involve the secret subversion of an opponent's campaign via outright lies, spying, or any other strategy intended to divert attention from policies, actual policies, in a questionable or dishonest way. At their finest, dirty tricks wear down the public's conference or conference in the political system. And at worst, they can cause lives. What we'll go into are a few of the most infamous cheats in the history of our politics. <laughs> But before we start, please make sure to subscribe to the Stimulus Check Update Lighthouse Alert community and hit the bell so you never miss an upload from us. Also, leave a like, right? Number one. Num JFK turns up the heat. The 1960 governmental election in between Senator John F. Kennedy and Vice President Richard Nixon was among the closest races in our political history. It is likewise significant for being the very first election where TV played a definitive role in identifying the winner. Now, Nixon and Kennedy had actually consented to a series of debates and disputes. The very first aired on live TV. Now, Kennedy had actually utilized the brand new medium of TV to fantastic result throughout his Massachusetts congressional races. And his campaign group understood how to handle their prospects on screen appearances to maximize his appeal. In contrast, Nixon had occasion to make television looks while vice president but his team had actually never used the medium during a competitive race. Prior to the very first debate on September 26, 1960, <laughs> the candidates had actually concurred that neither would utilize any makeup. Now, both Kennedy and Nixon broke this agreement, but in extremely different ways. Now, Kennedy had a layer of expertly applied makeup placed on prior to the argument, but Nixon- No, a God, please, no, no! Chief, to hide his five o'clock shadow. On top of that, Nixon's team understood that their candidate broke a sweat easily. So they set the thermostats good and cold. But Kennedy's group likewise learns about the vice president's hypohidrosis and secretly turned the temperature level up a few degrees and made it hotter. Now, when the electronic cameras began to roll, the distinction Seriously, in between the, the prospects was striking to audiences viewing at home. See, Kennedy appeared vibrant and relaxed while Nixon, who was just four years older than his opponent, put on a sweat and consistently needed to dry his face with a scarf. The argument was viewed by 70 million people and later on, the ballot showed that over half of the citizens were influenced by the prospect's debate efficiencies. Now, political researchers still argue over the impact of the debate. However, consider that Kennedy won the election by simply over 100,000 votes, a couple of degrees on the ah! distinction. Number two. John McCain's love child. In early 2000, the top contenders for the Republican nomination for president were Governor George W. Bush of Texas and Senator John McCain of Arizona. Now, Bush was better funded and had the support of the Republican establishment. But McCain's insurgent project had pulled off an upset throughout the first main contest in New Hampshire, beating Bush by 19 points. The second main would be held in South Carolina. And if Bush lost, there would be he likely to lose the election. But in Bush's top campaign strategist, Carl Rove, a guy known for his prisoners or take no prisoners approach to campaigning, Carl Rove's weapon of choice against I am the one the way you don't need. Need. It was a secret project. Now the secret campaign included spreading out a tawdry of malicious reports about his challenger John McCain, while making sure the rumors weren't traceable to them. Two weeks prior to the election, pamphlets began to appear under wind windscreens and jumbotrons at prospects arguments that used an image of John McCain with his adopted Bangladesh daughter to declare that John McCain had an invalid African-American child. A charge, of course, that might cause him votes in a state that had not completely left its awful history of segregation and racism. Next, of course, were the anonymous pollsters calling regional Republicans and asking if they would be basically likely to vote for John McCain if he were psychologically unstable due to his time in a POW camp in Vietnam. McCain, of course, was so enraged by these vicious attacks that he confronted George Bush in person to require that he stop. Now, when Bush rejected, responsibility for the character assassination, John McCain replied, don't give me that bull crap. By election day, John McCain had lost his lead and Bush won by 11 points. With no practical path to the election, John McCain dropped out of the race, but he never forgave George Bush for the attacks on his household and wartime heroics in history. Number three. George W. Bush, H.W. Bush, and Lee Atwater. 
This was the dark master of the dirty trick and the dirty secret. And he more than should have an entry all by himself. Now, he got his start in the House state of South Carolina, dealing with the 1978 Senate campaign for well-known segregationist Strong Thurmond. However, it wasn't until 1980 that Atwater's cutthroat tactics genuinely came forward when he functioned as project manager for Republican Congressman Floyd Spence in his race versus Democrat Tom Turnerspeed. Atwater found that Congressman Floyd Spence in his race versus Democrat Tom Turnerspeed, Atwater found that Turnerspeed had gone through electroconvulsive therapy as a teen to deal with a case of severe depression. From then on, when Atwater was inquired about Turnerspeed at any kind of interview, he would reply, I'm not in the habit of reacting to people that were attached to jumper cables. Now, Turner Speed attempted to direct the focus to the policy differences in between the prospects. However, by then, Atwater had actually triggered enough voters to question Turner Speed's mental health that he lost the race. But Atwater's most ruthless play, one that would ultimately earn him extensive condemnation from Republicans and Democrats, came when he handled George H.W. Bush's 1998 presidential project. Bush's Democratic opponent was Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. And by the middle of 1988, Dukakis was ballot a couple of points in the lead. It was then that Atwater chose the gloves needed to come off, resulting in the infamous Willie Horton commercial. While Governor of Massachusetts, Dukakis had actually overseen a program that approved weekend furloughs to founded guilty felons. Among those felons, founded guilty murderer Willie Horton who happened to be an African-American, was on furlough when he raped a white woman and stabbed her sweetheart. Atwater dealt with the number of outside groups to develop an ad about the furlough program that displayed Horton's face right away after an image of Dukakis. The racist overtones of the advertisement were so apparent that Atwater understood it would be political suicide for the Bush project and campaign to air it directly. Rather, he called several rich Republican donors to create a front group called the National Security Political Action Committee which then separately aired the advertisement. Atwater's goal, in his own words, was to make Willie Horton the caucus's running mate. When the advertisement aired, it had the desired effect of connecting Horton with the caucus in the minds of a lot of citizens. And when the inevitable charges of racism were leveled versus the Bush project, they vehemently rejected any connection to the advertisement. The Horton ad made it impossible for the caucus to shake the label of being solved on criminal offense. And his campaign entered into a death spiral. Come the election, he lost to Bush in a landslide. Now, Atwater was rewarded for his efforts by being made chairman of the Republican National Committee. However, after only a year in the position, he came down with an incurable brain cancer. Prior to the cancer, claimed him at age 40. He expressed regret for his callous techniques and even corresponded an apology to Turner Speed and the caucus. Though, some previous Atwater partners have actually questioned the genuineness of his regret. Number four. Phone jamming in New Hampshire. Leading into the 2002 midterm elections, the Democrats held a one-seat bulk in the U.S. Senate. Both parties battled to the nail to safeguard existing seats and get news. And maybe no place was more greatly objected to than the New Hampshire race in between Democratic Governor Jean Sheehan and Republican Representative John Sununu. As the election loomed, Sheehan and Sununu were running within a couple of portion points of each other which suggested both sides get out the vote operations on election day would make all the difference. The Democrats essential campaign was based around a series of phone banks runs by the party and affiliated unions who would call Sheehan's advocates to make certain they got to the surveys. Phone lines suspiciously decreased. On the day of the election, the Democrats operations ground to a stop when their phone lines suspiciously decreased. By the time the lines were back up, Sheehan's campaign had actually lost essential ground. The authorities opened an investigation and uncovered a dirty little trick that would land several local Republican officials in prison. Private investigators learned that Chuck McGee, the director of the New Hampshire Republican Party, had worked together with Republican strategist Alan Raymond to work with a telemarketing company to jam the Democrats' phone lines. McGee and Raymond were both found guilty of conspiracy to commit telephone harassment and sentenced to several months in prison. The regional director of the Republican Party, James Tobin, was likewise arraigned and found it guilty of conspiracy. But after the Republican Party invested more than $6 million in Tobin legal costs, his conviction was overturned on appeal. When it comes to the election, the phone jamming plan helped Sununu squeak out a 19,000 vote win over his opponent. However, Sheehan would stage a return in 2008 when he when she conveniently beat Sununu in a rematch for the Senate seat. Number five. 
Thomas Jefferson's pamphleteer. Next time you believe that today's politicians have actually brought campaigning to a brand new low, simply keep in mind to keep the election of 1800 on your plate. Dirty tricks are not a modern day creation and none other than Thomas Jefferson originated the oldest one in the book, spreading outright lies about your opponent. In 1800, the United States chose in between the Federalist Party's prospect, incumbent President John Adams, who was related to the strong main government and the financial industry, and the Democratic Republicans prospect Thomas Jefferson, who was linked with strong support for states, rights, agrarian class, the, you know, agriculture. The election was a struggle over the young nation's future, but the campaign had one crucial difference from modern day contests. See, prospects at the time had not actively campaigned, but rather had their supporters promote on their behalf. In fact, both Adams and Jefferson stayed in the House throughout the project and campaign. But don't believe that the prospects weren't playing a main behind-the-scenes function in the campaigns. See, Jefferson called one of his supporters, pamphleteer or writer of pamphlets, James Callender, to print a series of vicious tracts spreading out lies about John Adams. Callender's publications alleged that Adams intended on going to war with France, that he had a hermit predictable character which has neither the force of a guy nor the gentleness and sensibility of a lady see calendar's slanderous attacks damaged adam's trustworthiness and assisted thomas jefferson to win the election it offered his role in thomas jefferson's triumph and win now it shouldn't have actually come as a surprise when calendar wanted a favor from the brand new president thomas jefferson's previous attack dog wished to ply his abilities as postmaster of richmond virginia but after the contentious election, Thomas Jefferson wished to appoint moderates instead. Now, Calendar did not take this rejection well. He struck back against his previous manager with anger and fervor. And he published instead a numerous amount of scandalous handouts about Thomas Jefferson himself. <laughs> it's crazy now. Consisting of the very first print claims that he fathered kids with his servant, Sally Hemings. A truth that would come out by DNA screening almost 200 years later on. However, aside from tarnishing Thomas Jefferson's public image, Calendar accomplished little with his attacks and he died in obscurity number six nixon's plumbers he understood richard nixon would be on this list of course this entry deals with a notorious group of people called the white house plumbers because they repaired leakages the plumbers were composed largely of former cia representatives whose activities were funded off the books by siphoning money from the Nixon's re-election campaign. The plumber's first jobs involved preventing leaks of categorized documents concerning the administration's foreign policy. This is way before the internet. The White House had been rocked by the revelation of the Pentagon Papers, a classified report leaked by State Department staff member Daniel Ellsberg, revealing that presidents had been lying about the Vietnam War given that the days of Eisenhower. In retaliation, the White House brought the plumbers to burglarize the workplace of Ellsberg's psychiatrist to discover details that might discredit Ellsberg himself. Now, the plumbers likewise conspired to burn the Brookings Institution, a center-left think tank, because the White House believed that staff members of the organization might be leaking classified State Department documents to the press. But the plumbers didn't simply repair those leaks. As 1972 neared, the group started to expand their operations to include sabotaging Nixon himself's political opponents. The group's most popular act was to break in the Democratic National Committee's head office at the Watergate office complex. Five of the plumbers were apprehended when a watchful security guard saw a strip of tape covering a door lock, and then he called the cops. The break-in eventually caused Nixon's downfall. It's called Watergate. Now, as reporters and congressional investigators continue to penetrate monetary connections between the Watergate burglars, which were the plumbers, and Nixon's re-election committee, and the White House reacted by devoting bribery, perjury, and blockage to hide the truth. The plumbers' dirty tricks wound up removing President Richard Nixon instead of his challengers. Number seven. Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, debate game. We have another presidential argument and another cheat that may have tipped the result of the election. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter was fighting for re-election versus previous California governor, Ronald Reagan. By late 1980, no. Carter, Jimmy Carter, no. had actually recuperated from devastatingly low approval ratings triggered by his handling of the Iran hostage crisis and was running neck and neck with Ronald Reagan. Jimmy Carter repeatedly declined his challenger's ask for a debate, resulting in Ronald Reagan's specifically discussing a third party candidate rather. But Jimmy Carter lastly relented and the only dispute between the prospects was set 
to happen exactly one week prior to the election. The Jimmy Carter campaign was busy preparing when it received a shock copy of the campaign's dispute prep book detailing the president's method and talking points had actually been stolen from the White House and delivered to Ronald Reagan's campaign headquarters. During the subsequent debate, Reagan handled himself accordingly, delivering several amusing rejoinders to Jimmy Carter's attacks. While Carter fumbled a question about nuclear arms, Ronald Reagan pulled ahead of Jimmy Carter's after the argument and went on to win the election in a landslide. As for Jimmy Carter, he still feels that the theft of his dispute prep book contributed to his loss that November. The debate surrounding the theft, which became referred to as debate gate, did not end with the election. The FBI opened an investigation to find the offender, while a congressional subcommittee conducted a separate investigation into the matter. The strongest suspect at the time was Ronald Reagan's project manager, Bill Casey, who went on to lead the CIA during the 1980s, but neither the FBI nor the congressional subcommittee were ever able to recognize Bill Casey as a thief. Now, a more recent theory competes that Paul Corbin, a Democratic strategist and friend of the Kennedy family, lagged the theft. According to this theory, Corbin, Paul Corbin, was still bitter about the harsh campaign between Jimmy Carter and Senator Ted Kennedy for the Democratic Party's nomination. And out of spite, he copied the argument prep book and provided it to Bill Casey, who was Ronald Reagan's campaign manager. And this theory has its doubters, however, is supported by the fact that Paul Corbin visited Reagan's project headquarters three times right away before the debate. Number eight. Election in between Congressman James Garfield and General Winfield Scott Hancock saw a cheat that used the popular bias of the time. In those days, there were widespread prejudice versus the Chinese immigration. Although Chinese Americans constituted less than 1% of the population, it was in the middle of this environment that a bombshell rocked the project or the campaign when just days prior to the election, a letter signed by Garfield was found and published in the New York famous newspaper. In the letter called the Maury Letter after its desired recipient, Garfield announced his support for unregulated Chinese immigration to the United States. The letter caused an outcry and in a response that would be exceptional today. Garfield held back making a statement since he wasn't instantly sure whether he had in fact pinned the letter or not. While Garfield aides combed through his files to see if he had in fact composed the missive letter, Hancock's advocates savaged Garfield in journalism, claiming that his policies would trigger a wave of immigration that would cost Americans their jobs. Garfield's assistants lastly validated that the letter was a forgery a week after the story broke and the campaign entered into damage control mode in a relocation that he should have most likely taken when the story initially broke he took the position too late garfield provided newspapers with a copy of the old letter that he had composed so they could release it together with the maury letter and readers could compare his handwriting and signature for themselves garfield's reaction handed winfield away and garfield's reaction hand led to stem the outrage triggered by the preliminary release of the forgery and he went on to narrowly win the election by a simple 2,000 votes. Though historians believe the Maury letter made the election much closer than it would otherwise have actually been costing Garfield success in California and Nevada. Number nine. The so-called riot at Brooks Brothers. The 2000 governmental election between George W. Bush and Al Gore was one of the closest in American history as well. Ultimately decided the day after the election, the new candidate had actually reached the magic number of 270 electoral votes required to win, given that the vote tally in Florida was too close to call. Now, Bush maintained a lead of 1,784 votes on election night, but a compulsory recount narrowed his lead to just a few hundred votes. Then Al Gore's campaign used an arrangement or agreement in Florida law to demand that a number of countries, excuse me, a number of counties carry out a manual recount. It protested this backdrop that a mini riot assisted closed down the recount. On November 18, 2000, the Miami-Dade County Election Department was intensely sifting through piles of votes by hand in order to fulfill the Florida Supreme Court's due date. In action, the Republican Party utilized its national facilities to organize a protest with the objective of shutting down the recount. Numerous angry protesters showed up at the election workplace, yelling and pounding on the glass doors of the structure. Election officials stopped the public recount and continued their work in a small space out of public view. It was this relocation that triggered that would become called the Brooks Brothers Riot, called after the line of conservative suitwear stereotypically associated with the Republican congressman. 
and facility. The protesters, a few of whom were later and identified as team member of Republican Congress, got in the structure and beat on the door where the recount was happening, with some officials declaring they were pushed or struck when they tried to talk to the protesters. The condition added to the county election board's choice to stop the recount. The whole issue became mute a couple of weeks later on when the United States Supreme Court ruled that Florida's recount breached the Equal Protection Clause and bought an immediate halt, which in effect provided Bush the election. When it comes to those protesters at the county election department, numerous later went on to land positions in the Bush's administration. Number 10. Nixon sabotages the Paris Peace Talk. By 1968, the Vietnam War had actually remained in full speed for four years. In March, President Lyndon Johnson ordered a limit to U.S. battle of North Vietnam in order to open up peace talks. Nixon, Richard Nixon, who promised he had a secret plan to win the war, understood that any peace talk concluded prior to the election would ravage his possibilities of winning the presidency and the election. So Nixon chose to communicate a secret message to the president of South Vietnam, Nguyen Van Thieu, claiming that he would secure a better offer for South Vietnam if he won the election. Thieu, who figured he had little to lose because he had and could pursue a deal regardless of who won the election, revoked the peace talks at the last minute. And President Lyndon B. Johnson became aware of Nixon's machinations and his attempts when the NSA wiretaps of South Vietnam's U.S. ambassador revealed the plot of Nixon. Now, President Lyndon B. Johnson raged at what he thought about Nixon's traitorous actions. However, he had avoided from advertising it for fear of signaling to the South Vietnamese that their ambassador's interactions were being kept track of. That doesn't mean that Lyndon B. Johnson just sat idly by, but he utilized every backroom channel offered to thwart President Richard Nixon. Now, Lyndon B. Johnson ordered the FBI to position Nixon's campaign under monitoring and relayed the details of the plot to Democratic candidate Hubert Humphrey so that his campaign might publicize Nixon's treachery. However, Humphrey's assistants believed he would smoothly win the election. And the project saw no requirement to make the shocking allegation that a governmental prospect had actually taken part in treason. Meanwhile, the Richard Nixon campaign continued to berate the Democrats for stopping working to make any development in dealing with the Vietnam War. Now, Richard Nixon even had the goal to use to take a trip to South Vietnam to get you back to the negotiating table. We can only picture how efficient that conference would have been. But Nixon eventually went on to win the election by less than 1%, at which point it ended up that his secret plan for peace in Vietnam was to intensify the U.S. bombing project and to expand the war into neighboring Cambodia and Laos. In 1973, the United States would reach a peace deal with North Vietnam under much of the very same terms as those discussed in 1968. Over 22,000 American soldiers died in those five years, together with many more Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotians. Proof that sometimes cheats can have a death toll connected to them. Nancy Pelosi's, Trump's, and Biden's three-way stimulus check plot, and a scenario that shows how Nancy Pelosi could become president. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat from California, met with reporters at the Capitol of Washington. Now, settlements between Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin for extra coronavirus aid and a relief bill were abruptly halted recently by President Donald Trump. Now, President Donald Trump was confident that he was going to win. And he stated that after the election, we will get the very best stimulus package that you've ever seen. While Trump said the White House will continue to negotiate with Speaker Nancy Pelosi, he had been implicating her of pursuing bailouts for cities and states badly run by Democrats. Influence. So Nancy Pelosi identified Trump as being delusional for making the very same prediction last week. Currently, the Cook Political Report anticipated Democrats will not only win the House and win the Senate, but win everything. But that issue is a big virus relief bill for millions of Americans that would send out another $1,200 direct stimulus check payment to many Americans. Now, Pelosi said that she desired a relief bill and hopes for a $2.2 trillion package. Now, it is claimed that Nancy Pelosi is second in line after Vice President Mike Pence to assume the presidency of the United States. It is declared Nancy Pelosi is second in line after Vice President Mike Pence. For that reason, ought to be the worst ever occur to the president and vice president, she could theoretically take control of the White House. Another circumstance where the next in line would take over 
is if the brand new president and vice president has actually not been inaugurated by the end of Trump's term at 12 noon on January 20th, 2021. Now, what has Nancy Pelosi stated about the prospect of ending up president? Well, on July 2020, Pelosi noted that she is in line for the presidency. She stated that the presidency is the presidency. She was a key figure in Trump's impeachment and the president has actually formally banded her and called her dumb while condemning her actions. So the object is to hold back stimulus and by holding back stimulus and creating a situation where the American people are in frenzy and desperate to pay their bills and even during a pandemic when it's dangerous to go out and vote, people will desperately flood the polls to vote. They can create a situation where by promising for stimulus after they get elected, they can create a situation where people will vote for them desperately. And then it's possible that she can get a seat as the president during the time that they're trying to figure out who the president will be. I value you if you're listening to this. I value you. You know what I'm saying? And thank you for subscribing to the community. And I'll see you in the next video.